thanks everyone for coming. I hope you're enjoying uh, PyCon UK and I hope I won't uh, change that trend. Um, a couple of things whilst people are arriving just before I get properly started. The first is to thank my employers, Clinithink, um, for paying for me to come along today. We are local. Um, we're, we're a distributed organisation but the head office is about half an hour that way on the trains, uh, assuming the trains actually run on time. I was having a chat with Andrew, one of the other speakers, about that over lunch. Um, the other thing is I'm very pleased that PyCon UK has returned to Cardiff. It's a great city, and as a small tribute, I'm using a bit of a yellow theme to these slides. Um, and that's because the Tour de France was won by local boy G, Geraint Thomas. Um, he wore the yellow jersey, which is what he gets as race leader in the yellow in the, in the Tour de France, and he won the race overall. Coincidentally, um, he went to the same school, local school, Whitchurch High School, as Gareth Bale, who's a footballer, and Ruth, who I work with, who's also represented her country at football. So, big it up to Cardiff. As uh, Marco said, Tim Taddy is an acronym. It stands for There is More Than One Way to Do It. Um, in programming circles, it's closely associated with the Pearl community. I've done a little bit of trying to find out exactly when the language adopted it as a slogan. And the best I could come up with was 1999. So almost 20 years ago, Larry Wall gave a talk to a Linux group, and he explained how Perl came to be. It's a, it's a brilliant talk, and I do recommend, if you get the slides, click anything orange. It will take you to that talk. Probably many of you have come across it. Anyway, he explains what's meant by there is more than one way to do it via an anecdote with his daughter Heidi. They're driving along in a car, and she tells him about this approach they use in her maths class, which is exactly this. There's more than one way to do it. So rather than studying topic by topic, rather than doing matrices, then algebra, then geometry, you try and use it all at the same time, so you're always seeing things in context. You've got the bigger picture. Um, and she herself likens it to another phrase they have at school, which is rather shorter. It's there. It's all good. If someone's feeling down, it's all good. It doesn't mean that everything's good. Of course not. It doesn't mean there's good in everything. It means that the whole thing, the big picture, is good. And Pearl epitomises this. Um, Larry Wall explains how he assembled the language by taking the best bits of all the best languages out there. Uh, just like I'm going to take the best bits of Larry Wall's best talks. Um, <laughs> And that, as a consequence, if you're doing Perl, you can, you can write a variety of styles. You can have a one-liner where the variables are implied and the error handle is missing. Error handling is missing. It doesn't matter. It gets the job done. Or you could write something like a nicely structured C program, if you wanted, with functions and braces and semicolons, object-oriented code, functional programming, super shell scripts. It's all good. More than one way to do it. Now, I realise that this is a Python conference. What I wanted to do was talk about where Python stands on the number of ways there are to do it. Um, the most obvious answer I came up with, the immediate answer, is this less known acronym, SPO APU AUDI, um, <laughs> which is taken from ZOP. <laughs> uh, I think many of you would be familiar with ZOP, the Zen of Python. In fact, if you've logged into the Slack channel for uh, PyCon UK, you'll see these messages come up as the channel is loading. It says cryptic things like explicit is better than implicit. If you get the whole list of 20, of which 19 have been written down, they together describe the Python way. And it's quite easy to track this down to a Python mailing list uh, topic, the Python way. And Tim Peters wrote the original Zen of Python. I'm assuming most people here have come across it, but... Uh, it's worth looking at again. Um, Python would have been about 10 in 1999, so it was not quite an old pearl, but very established by then. Python 2 had been released. And it was getting popular to the extent that uh, I get the impression they were getting some unsolicited enhancement requests. People wanted things in that didn't perhaps belong with Python to the more experienced Pythonistas. Things like ternary expressions or assignment operations, things that just didn't belong. And as a, a way of countering this, heading it off, Tim Peters produced this rather lovely uh, list, which has since become known as the Zen of Python, um, you know, that, that says this is what 
your enhancement request should fit with, if you like, or this is what, where Python's at. And number 13, ZOP13, which seems to go against Tim Toad, he seems to be an anti-Pearl sentiment, there should be one, preferably only one, obvious way to do it. And then as if realising that sounds a little bit uh, prescriptive, maybe even pompous, he takes it down a peg with number 14. It's quite a witty list. It might not be obvious unless you're Dutch. Um, unfortunately, the keynote speaker I don't think is here. Luke, is anyone Dutch in the audience? Is it obvious if you're Dutch? <laughs> At first, I'm assuming that uh, Peters was referring not to all Dutch people, but to uh, Guido van Rossum, the benevolent dictator for life. So this is a bit odd then. We've got a dictator who finds things obvious and he's telling us the one way of doing things. I'm a programmer. I'm a bit like a, a toddler or a teenager. I don't want people to know better than me and I don't want them telling me what to do. How can it be that Python has only increased in popularity since 1999 when it's this rigid and inflexible? Well, first of all, there are some compromising words. It says, should be one, preferably only, obvious. So, so it's allowing the possibility that there's no way of doing it, or there are lots of ways of doing it, or the only way of doing it is not <coughs> obvious. Um, secondly, I just don't think it's true at all. It, it looks good, and it's, uh, it contrasts nicely with Pearl, but in fact, what I'm going to try and convince you um, is that Python offers multiple ways of doing things, and it's continuing to add them, and it's better for it. A Tim Top, more than one Python. There wasn't when Tim Peters wrote the list. The obvious choice would be Python 2. It wasn't that there were, weren't other versions. There were, but Python 2 was bigger and better and backwards compatible. Now, of course, we've got Python 2 and Python 3. <clears throat> now, many of you will say, well, obviously, you should be using Python 3, and yet... At this conference, we've got talks about Python 2, usually how to migrate from it. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't the case that for the whole coexistence of these two flavors of the language that Python 3 was the one to choose. I think uh, some of the most respected pundits would only have suggested moving to Python 3 at Python 3.6, which it ain't that old. Python 3's been around for almost a decade. Um, and it remains the case that if you have Python 2 to hand and you're more familiar with it, maybe you're maintaining a Python 2 code base, it's usable. Um, you might not want to fuss about the difference between a, a byte and a character. You might just want to get a job done. No one's stopping you. There's more than one way to do it. And indeed, there are other flavors of Python. Um, I see quite a lot of uh, Jupyter at uh, presentations. It's like a literate programming environment that packages in Python and includes support for text and diagrams and enhanced numerical capabilities, all beautifully wrapped together. More than one way to do it, all good. And once you've chosen your flavor of the language, Tim Tauti, um, I should have said there's more than one way to transform collections. I don't really mean iteration, but I couldn't get that <coughs> pronounceable as an acronym. <coughs> but if I was to write something like this, a lot, of, a lot of you might sort of not let that through code review. They're saying, too many lines, you can do that much more declaratively. I'm taking the range of numbers from 0 up to 41, and I'm producing the list of their squared values. It's, it's just a little example. Could have done it like that, obviously better. Um, of course, it's not necessarily better. Both techniques are valid. There's no deprecating of for loops in the language. And there comes a point at which the body of the loop becomes sufficiently complicated, that even if all you're actually doing is, is adding an item to a list, you might well choose the for loop. They're both valid. And again, you might say, well, hang on, the range was a lazy collection. It's not all there. Why should we convert it to a sort of in-memory collection? Why not just have a, a lazy result, something that will yield values, like this, uh, this generator expression? So it's, a, it's different. It's another way of doing it. And you might say, what's special about 42? What does it mean? What's 42 about? Why not just give all the squared values? And now at the bottom, we've got, uh, this is a slightly, I don't know, obscure way of doing it. It's not obvious, but I, I think it's interesting. It's interesting to me that the asterisk is no longer multiplication. It's a sort of tuple unpacking. And the multiplication is operator.mul, 
Um, I, I haven't properly namespaced things here for brevity. Um, it's, a, it's a useful technique. It's something to be aware of. So there are lots of ways of iterating. There are lots of ways of transforming collections. Each one of them you can apply in any of these sorts of situations. It's all good, right? Um, anyone want to guess <laughs> while I have a drink what that might be? I'm talking about the batteries in Python. That means not that Python... Uh, well, it means that Python comes with libraries to do things. It includes batteries. Sometimes it includes a choice of batteries. You know, more than one, that's good. Ever Ready or Duracell. Tinterpom is an example. There is <clears throat> more than one program options module. Even within the standard library, there isn't a, a single choice. These three are all from the standard library. Um, and you can see that Python started off by borrowing things. If it ain't broke, don't reinvent it. Um, get opt. Apart from nowadays, people come straight to Python. They don't necessarily come from that GNU Linux background. Um, they might prefer to move to argpars. Optpars was a sort of, I think it's now deprecated, but it's still there, and it could well be you've got no pressing urgency to, to move from it. Um, here's a little bit of documentation <coughs> that argpars uses to promote itself. And it's basically saying, use argpars unless you're a little bit of an idiot. <laughs> um, sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't use that term, but it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous thing to say. Who wouldn't want to write less code and have better help and error message? That's exactly what you want to do with your command line parsing. And yet I think there's every chance there'll be a getarg module put in the standard library in a couple of years' time that's even less code, even nicer uh, help, and error messages. These things get reinvented. They get... Uh, they get better, and there are indeed, when I said et cetera, et cetera, there are other reinventions. They're not trying to beat argpars, they're trying to do something a bit orthogonal, like, um, you know, why not generate your command line parser from the help text? Start with the beautiful help text, end up with the command line parser. There's a module to do it. Why bother writing a command line parser? Can't Python just look at your module and see what functions take what parameters and create an interface? Wouldn't that be nice? It's possible. More than one way to do it. Um, one more example of the batteries, Tim Tout, unit test frameworks. This is a classic for choice and reinvention. We've got unit test and doc test, both in the standard library. They're doing different things. Unit test, again, is, is sort of taking what's been invented in other languages and, and, and Python version of it. So it's familiar. You don't have to rethink how you think about unit tests. Hang on, let's rethink it. Let's do doc tests. Let's look at the document strings in your function and execute code in them and check it does what it's supposed to. Much more Pythonic, I suppose, or, or something you can do in Python that you can't do in other languages. And I quite like that sort of looking at strings and executing code. Reminds me of Perl a bit. And, uh, yeah, PyTest, non-standard, de facto winner, I think. It's, it's the best apart from the others that are improving on it. <coughs> Again, uh, just to quote the unit test documentation, um, it says, inspired by JUnit, has a similar flavor to major unit test frameworks. For me, that flavor's a bit stodgy. Um, that's why I prefer PyTest. If you're, if you're, if you're using uh, unit test, you have to create fixtures and call special methods. You can't just call a function and assert its result like PyTest. So PyTest, there's more than one way to do it. Um, the downside, I suppose, is you have to work out where you're going to get it from and what version and things like that. Okay. So you could say that what I've been describing so far is really uh, evolution. It doesn't <coughs> go against ZOP13. So although things keep getting reinvented, the best choice is always the most recent once it's settled in, that is. So Python 3 is the, the obvious choice, you know, once it's matured, Python 3.6. Uh, PyTest is the more recent uh, unit test framework. It's the obvious choice. I'm not sure about that, and my counter example is um, Tim to Woffs. It's an area where Python has always had multiple ways of doing things, and it's still continuing to add more, and I'm, I'm rather happy it, it is adding more because it, it seems to be getting better to me. So... More than one way of formatting strings. 
There's more than one way of writing a string literal. Double quotes, single quotes. Um, when all things are equal, I prefer less, I suppose. So I tend to choose single quotes because it's less marks on the page. A few, few, few less pixels. If going in the other direction, you can have triple quotes. Um, that allows you to do some extra things inside your string, if you like. You can have a little R outside the quotation marks. You choose the quotation marks. It's all good. That's a, a raw string. It does different things with uh, embedded escape sequences. So, in fact, the slash R isn't a, a carried return escape sequence. It's a slash and an R, which is useful if you want it in a regular expression, maybe. And by the way, the R could be a capital R, and you could use triple quotes, so you could have a raw string. <laughs> and once you want to uh, interpolate, so I've got two variables, who, Thomas, that's me, noodles, that's what I enjoy eating. I want to put that in a, in a, in a string. I want to put those variables interpolated. <coughs> the first way of doing it, I suppose, Again, borrowed from Python's predecessors. It borrowed from C. It's using the percent format specifier. And it's kind of wittily overloading the percent operator. And uh, until recently, this remained my favorite, even though I know it's been uh, improved on. Um, so that's like from printf. Then you've also got in the standard library, you've got string template, which allows you to use the dollar syntax, a bit like shell parameter expansion. Oh. Probably not so well known because there are third-party templating libraries that get used in your, um, your HTML generating engine web packages. But there's another way, so that's two, two ways of doing it. Python 3 introduced the dot .format method on strings and a whole new way of putting in your format specifiers. Um, secretly, I, I didn't particularly like it because it's a little bit longer and I had to learn something new that didn't bring me massive advantages. Um, nonetheless, it's probably the way you should be doing it. And at Python 3.6, you've got the F strings, which is finally, you know, I think, I thought to myself when I saw this coming, that's what I want. I want F strings. That's Pythonic. That's compact. I'll use that all the time. In fact, I don't. I continue to find different uses at different times for the different ones. And I don't think Python is weaker for it. None of these methods are going away. They're not deprecated. They're all there. They all support each other. It's all good. Um, by the way, we're now, with F strings, allowing the possibility of uh, doing a bit like doc test, evaluating code in strings. So I thought I'd show you a bad example. So I'm starting with a string, which I want to produce an acronym for it. I want a handy acron acronymizer, if such a word exists. Um, so there we've got an F string. It's got a triple quoted string inside it. It's escaping some new lines so that we compact it all. I was looking for an, a very bad <laughs> example, and I'm sure there are much worse ones. I would, I would solicit, you know, if anyone can think of an egregious example of writing code in strings, and there at the bottom it's come up with the, the acronym version. <laughs> How long have I got? Five minutes, right. Um, I don't want to go through all this. I've got to the end of my argument. I've, I've shown you that there are multiple ways of doing things. Now I want to tie it back into Perl. Zen of Python. Um, we've, we've, we've decided that item 13 is wrong, or I've tried to persuade you. Items 1 to 12 do a very good job of uh, describing Python. And coincidentally, they describe exactly why it's not like Perl, right from the top. Beautiful is better than ugly. Perl would say, you have to have ugly to allow beautiful, or you know, who's, to, who's to judge it? Explicit, implicit. Perl loves implicit. Um, errors should never pass silently. That's uh, ex unless explicitly silenced. Perl is the other way round. They're very different <coughs> languages. Zen of Python should have stopped at, uh, at a dozen. Couldn't resist throwing this one in. The Taming of the Camel, uh, Larry Wall, introducing Perl 5. Quite a, 25 years ago, almost. And he says here, ugly can be beautiful. Beautiful can get ugly real quick. We all know that. Uh, I'm interested that he says, I think God has free will. So I'm, I'm looking now at, at God and Larry Wall, Christian, Western religion, contrast with Python, Zen, Eastern religion. Um, but I'm not going to go down that, that particular discussion point. I don't care what other people think. 
I care what other people think. How hard is it to be in charge of a language? Which brings me to uh, Guido Van Rossum talking about his uh, uh, Luke talk this morning, stepping down. People despise his decisions. He had to fight hard for PEP 572, which, by the way, was one of those features that was probably, it's probably people have been nagging for it or pushing for it. You know, myself included, it's something I would have liked, a way of having loops that you don't have to break out of. Um, but that's tough, really, to find people despising your decisions. And I think uh, possibly what was so particularly difficult about this PEP is maybe it seemed to go against what people thought of was the Python way. Maybe it really was offering one way too many to do things. I don't know. Um, as I say, I'm looking forward to it, but let's wait and see. It's, it'll be there in 3.8, I assume. <coughs> Back again to Larry Wall, talking about more than one way of doing things. How many times have we heard a program should do one thing and do it well? Perl isn't trying to do one thing well, it tries to do everything well. The same argument. If you have a hammer, everything looks like it starts to look like a nail. So if you've got one tool, one programming language, you force all your programs down the same line. Well, no, says Larry, that's not true. And Perl has been described not as a hammer, but as a Swiss army chainsaw. <laughs> Larry Wall prefers another tool, and uh, he substitutes duct tape for hammer. If all you have is duct tape, Everything starts to look like a duct. Yeah, right. When's the last time you used duct tape on a duct? <laughs> um, I happen to use some to mend the switch in my shower. I would say Python, despite claiming to offer a single way of doing things, actually offers lots of ways of doing things and is the better for it. It's more duct tape than hammer. I thought the uh, link to the slides was here. I'll post a link in the Slack channel. That's, that's pretty much it. Um, have I got time for... Thank you. Thank you very much for I think it's good to have choice, and I think it's good to celebrate options and be aware of them. I think uh, I've gone against the kind of... If you, languages like Go really do try and tie you down as regards formatting, and, uh, and they won't include things like list comprehensions, um, or they haven't done. I, I like the, the diversification and the, and the multiplicity of approaches and the freedom it gives you. So... You know, possibly it's, it's more difficult for teachers and possibly want to introduce things. Maybe, I don't, I'd say yes. That's my quick answer. Thank you. <coughs> Gilles. Oh, sorry. Do you really think there is something such as Pythonic? I'm starting to think when I come here that uh, I'm interested to... It, it, it's almost more about community. Um, I just think this particular aphorism deserved calling out. People like to think that it's sort of pure and there's only one way and it's beautiful and clean. Well, it is clean, but nonetheless, there are multiple ways of doing it. And I don't think... Yeah, I think we should, we should celebrate that and, you know, strike out item 13. <coughs> yes, there is Pythonic, but it, it's, it's as much about the community. And, uh, yeah, there, there, there is, I think... Items 0 to 12 are good. And the other ones, you know, things about namespaces being honking good ideas, they're <laughs> rightly at the bottom of the list. That's all. <coughs> Maybe more of a discussion question, but uh, those, uh, those ways of doing things differently, the, one could argue that they are obviously different ways of doing things, like the F string, you could only use if there's variables, simple strings if there are just no variables. Would you like to maintain something that's, that's uh, done in a way that's T-Y, uh, there's many ways to do it in this? 
Are you saying, would I like to maintain code that is uh, quite diverse? I've, I've become quite accepting. I've, I've kind of, uh, I like to fit in with the style of code that I'm in. I mean, sometimes I'll, to understand things, I almost rewrite things my way if I think I'm safe doing things, but uh, I don't want to impose my way. No, I, I respect where things are coming from, and uh, unless there's something, you know, some obvious, real reason to do with performance or, 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 or something. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.